Hello everyone, this is Mr. Delph. On today's video for biology, we are going to talk about the concept of descent with modification. So what do you need to know before we can understand this new topic? Well, as we have needed to know for this entire unit, genes are pieces of DNA that tell a cell how to make a protein. These genes code for different traits. When all of these different proteins get made, they have different effects on the organism. Some of these traits help the organism to survive, which we call being beneficial. Some of these traits don't help the organism to survive, or even put it in harm's way, which we call detrimental. Over time, the organisms that have the most successful traits and the least detrimental traits live longer. The longer they live, the more chances they have to mate and produce offspring. And then the more offspring they have, the more the future generation is like them, the more their successful traits and successful genes appear in the future. So what is descent with modification? Well, the concept is actually pretty simple. It's just taking that last idea we had in the review and then making it happen over a long period of time. This idea that these small changes from generation to generation of a gene going from 30% common to 33% common, that if you keep making small changes generation after generation after generation, over and over and over, that eventually all of those small changes add up to a very big change. While during our lifetimes we don't get to see these large changes usually, because the average human is only going to be around somewhere between, you know, 75 to 100 years, hopefully, that's not a very long amount of time as far as the Earth is concerned. That's not a very long amount of time as far as biology is concerned. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And while we're not exactly sure exactly when life showed up, our current best guess is somewhere around 3.5 billion years ago. Life has been on Earth changing and growing and adapting for over three billion years. The tiny little hundred year span that we get to watch, it's not enough time to see the changes from Earth's perspective. So, how do we see those changes? Well, there's a couple of ways. Fossil data is usually the easiest to wrap your head around, and that's one we're going to be looking at in a moment. We can also sometimes be able to use DNA evidence to see these differences. Occasionally, we'll get Ice Age of era animals like woolly mammoths frozen in permafrost in places like Siberia. And essentially, that's, you know, a woolly mammoth stuck in your refrigerator for 9,000 years. It still has enough DNA that we can analyze it. Now, of course, with things like dinosaurs, that's much, much more difficult. Despite what Jurassic Park would lead you to believe, even if we got a mosquito trapped in amber that had feasted on dinosaur blood, the DNA would have rotted by then. Uh, you need other preservation techniques. All right, so what are some fossil lineages that we have? Well, the evolution of horses. Horses are... One of the better preserved fossil lineages that we have, one of the better sets of us being able to look at how fossils changed over time. Uh, part of that has to do with the American Midwest and the way that the weather and the ecosystem there formed and how it was just very conducive to the formation of fossils. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of fossils, not just horse or mammal fossils out in the American Midwest, just because it had the right geology for preserving corpses. But let's take a look at these bones. So in our picture over to the right, down at the bottom are the oldest ones. That's uh, Eohippus from 60 million years ago. And then up at the top is our newest one, and that's our modern horse, Equus. 
So there's an even further lineage we have called the Heracatherium. That's one step below Eohippus. That's actually our earliest, definitely a horse lineage fossil. Hyracotherium and Eohippus both didn't have hooves. They had toes. Now, those toes actually had really big toenails on them that would, you know, sort of give you the idea of each one having its own little hoof on it. But they had toes, not hooves, and their teeth were shaped different. In fact, their teeth were omnivore teeth. Now, that doesn't mean we know exactly that they were also eating meat or bugs in addition to their vegetables, but the shapes of their teeth didn't match that of a modern horse. And that's because they weren't living in the environment a modern horse lives in. They were living in a forest, a woodland, something you would more expect to see a deer in than the Great Plains that you would expect to see a horse in. So, how did this happen? Well, over time, climate change happened. And because of that climate change, the forest slowly transitioned into a grassland. Now, when I say slowly transitioned, I mean over millions of years. I don't mean like, oh, a couple generations. I mean thousands of generations. A very slow change. This forest turned into a plains. Now, the things that help you survive in a forest are not the same things that help you survive in the Great Plains. You no longer need a lot of dexterity to deal with tree roots, but you do need to be able to run very quickly because now there's nowhere to hide. Not really. So you need to get bigger so it's harder for predators to get you. You need longer legs so that it's easier to run. And you need some way to get a grip on that grassland. Well, when you extrapolate all of that out, you end up with a hoof, and a long leg, and a large animal, and that's a horse. And then if you're going to be around all that grass anyway, might as well use that as a primary food source. I know that this can seem difficult to understand, but the big thing to get from all of these lineages that we're going to go through, especially the next one, is that this did not happen overnight. This was not like one day an Eohippus gave birth to a horse. This was a series of very, very slow changes occurring over millions of years. So, another one that we actually have really good fossil evidence of, but some of you might have trouble understanding just because these are some big changes. When you looked at Eohippus and you looked at modern horse, you could sort of see that pattern. If you took an Eohippus, gave it hooves instead of toes, and made it like four times its size, it would look roughly like a horse. However, this thing... Oh boy. So here's the evolution of whales. So a long time ago, like 60 million years ago, if you're wondering why all these are starting 60 million years ago, you can do a little bit of research into the geologic time scale. There was a big catastrophic event that happened not very long before this that allowed all this to happen. All right, so here we have uh, Pachycetus. So Pachycetus is a terrestrial cetacean. We don't have terrestrial cetaceans anymore. If you wonder what a cetacean is, it's a whale or a dolphin and things that look like whales and dolphins. It's a mostly aquatic sea mammals. So this thing was living, as best we can tell, in northern Africa, and it lived on land. Now specifically, it lived on land near water. And what happened is that all of a sudden, because of a catastrophic event, the water was essentially free real estate. There weren't any big predators in it anymore, but there was a lot of food. So, the individuals within Pachycetus or Elamerix, which was another uh, previous version, that were better able to go into the water, that due to natural variation were just stronger swimmers, maybe they had bigger feet, 
Maybe they were slightly more streamlined. Just natural differences in their genetics. Those that could go into the water and stay there for longer were able to better survive because there was more food for them and more shelter for them. You extrapolate that over millions of years and they just keep getting better and better and better at surviving in water until eventually you end up with whales and dolphins who are very good at surviving in water. Now, it might feel like a very big stretch for some of y'all to go from something like the Dorudon to the baleen whale or the Dorudon to the Atlantic dolphin. So some of you are probably wondering, how can we tell that things like dolphins and whales probably used to have back legs? Well, because of these things called vestigial organs. So a vestigial organ or a vestigial structure, you can see it re written either way, is a body part in an organism that no longer serves a purpose. It doesn't have a job anymore. But it can help us to figure out what that organism's ancestor may have been like millions of years ago. So what you see over here is a drawing of the back part of a whale skeleton. Inside of a whale skeleton, there's just a floating pelvis and femur. There's just a floating hip bone and thigh bone. Now, if you think about the way that humans are put together or any land animal is put together, the backbone, the spine, connects to the pelvis, to the hip. But that's not what's happening here. Like, if the pelvis was still attached to the backbone, you can maybe make an argument that it was still serving for muscle attachment and it was still doing a job. But this thing's just floating in space. It's attached to nothing. It doesn't serve a purpose. But the evidence of this pelvis and femur still being in the whale tells us that some ancestor millions of years ago was using it, had one, needed one, because nature is very efficient. Or, if you want to think about it another way, nature is very lazy. If nature can get away with not spending energy, it's going to not spend energy. It takes energy to make bones. It takes energy to design a pelvis and a femur. Those wouldn't be there if at some point, millions of years ago, it hadn't helped this organism's ancestors. But they're not helping in the water. Those would have only helped on land. Humans also have a couple of vestigial structures, although some of these are debatable. The appendix is an example of a vestigial structure. Some of you may have gotten appendicitis and had to get an appendectomy. The appendix is, a, appendix is a very small organ that is located attached to the large intestine. In humans, it really doesn't do anything. It's too small. It's too withered. Uh, all it really does for us is sometimes get infected and potentially kill us if we don't get it cut out when it is infected. However, horses and donkeys have a very large appendix. In them, we call it a thing called a cecum, just because it's so much bigger, but it's the same organ. And in horses and donkeys, it's what allows them to digest grass. So humans cannot digest grass. Now, we can eat things like spinach and kale and broccoli, and we can eat leafy greens, and we'll get some nutrients out of them. But all of those leafy greens have a thing in them called dietary fiber, or cellulose, which is what makes up cell walls of plants. We can't digest that. But horses and donkeys, using their cecum, using their appendix, can. So why do we have this useless organ that just sometimes gets us killed? Well, because probably millions of years ago, we had an ancestor that survived primarily off of leaves and leafy greens and needed the ability to digest cellulose. But as time marched on and other food sources, better food sources, more efficient food sources became available, having that appendix became less and less and less important. And so nature did what nature does. It got efficient or it got lazy and it just started making it less and less and less and less because using less energy is more favorable. Wearing yourself out less is more favorable. 
Wisdom teeth may potentially be a vestigial structure. As far as your EOC is concerned, wisdom teeth will be considered a vestigial structure. There is recent evidence to suggest this may not be true. So there's an idea that our ancestors, because they were cracking bones open with their back molars and getting the marrow out of them, that they were using these wisdom teeth, or that our ancestors, because they didn't have access to modern dentistry and toothpaste and toothbrushes and floss, were losing teeth at a faster rate than we were. And so this other set of molars popping in later in life was useful to them. In modern day, the general consensus is that for most people, the human jaw just isn't large enough for wisdom teeth anymore. That's why a lot of times people have to get theirs taken out. There just isn't room and they start pushing on other teeth and other roots and it can do bad things. However, there is some recent evidence to suggest that human jaw size is affected by a thing called phenotypic plasticity. That essentially, if we ate harder foods and chewier foods when we were children, little, little children, like when we were still teething, instead of just baby mush, that our jaws would have developed to be larger. That the size of a human jaw is not entirely based off of your genetics, it's also based off of your environment. And that chewing on harder and chewier foods when you're younger results in a larger jaw when you're older, and then the wisdom teeth can grow in. You see, our ancestors back in caveman days wouldn't have had as much soft food as we do. They wouldn't have had breads. I mean, they would have had fruits and stuff like that, but a lot of their food would have been like hard nuts and meats and just whatever they could scrounge. Because of that, they probably chewed a lot of tough stuff, and so they had the larger jaw. So wisdom teeth are iffy. Take that one with a grain of salt, but your EOC is going to call it a vestigial organ. The goosebump reflex is another vestigial structure, organ, reflex, get iffy. Uh, but essentially, if you see a animal that's cold and it pops up its fur, that's what your goosebump reflex is trying to do when you get cold. It's trying to puff up your fur to keep you warm. Or if you get scared, if you've ever seen a cat get scared and it pops up its fur to look bigger. Same thing with humans. If you get scared, goosebumps pop up. It's your body going, oh no, make our fur bigger so that we're scarier and bigger. <laughs> Not very useful when you have tiny human hair, but yeah, that's why it's vestigial. It's left over. All right, moving on. Divergent evolution. So divergent evolution is basically what happens when you combine the idea of descent with modification with adaptive radiation from our previous videos. This is where a population or a species gets exposed to a bunch of different environments for so long without interacting with each other that they start adapting differently and eventually become an entirely new species. This can take different amounts of times for different kinds of animals or plants or organisms. Basically, the faster you can reproduce, the faster you can adapt and evolve and change. But divergent evolution is where one species becomes bunches of different species because of new environments. Homologous structures are an evidence for this divergent evolution. So a homologous structure is a term for a body part of an organism that does different jobs, but has the same basic construction. So it's put together about the same way, but they do very different things. For instance, if you look over here at the limbs of various animals, we have a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. You can see that these are all put together basically the same way. You've got one bone attaching to the shoulder. Two bones attaching to that, which is usually an elbow, a bunch of little piddly wrist bones, and then a bunch of finger bones. But a human hand, a cat leg, a whale flipper, and a bat wing all do very different things and are all used for very different things. This same design shows us that there was probably some common ancestor a very long time ago that had this design. And then as time went on for millions or billions of years, those designs slowly adapted to different purposes. But you had to keep the same basic design structure because that's what you had to work with. Now, this is not to be confused with convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is when two species that are not closely related, when they live in similar environments, adapt in similar ways. 
So over here on the right, we have a flying squirrel and a sugar glider. These look very similar when you're just staring at them. However, they're actually not that closely related. You see, flying squirrels are squirrels. They're related to other squirrels and rodents. Whereas sugar gliders are marsupials. They are much more related to possums than they are to squirrels. So this is one of the issues of where we need to use DNA to help figure this stuff out instead of just trying to look at the structures. The DNA of these tell us they are very far apart. That sugar glider is closer related to a possum than it is to another flying squirrel. But you can see how previous scientists may have been confused with this. So divergent, one species turning into a bunch of different ones. Convergent, different species adapting in the same way. So I know this was kind of a long one, but that's it for our Descent with Modification. If you have any questions, as always, pop into the Google Classroom for a Google Meet or send me an email. Don't forget to answer your questions on Google Classroom. And as always, I hope everyone has a good day.